Hello friends, my name is Katja and you are welcome to my channel. In my last video I made an 1860s crinoline. Now it is time to make the dress itself. I took my inspiration from this painting. It's called Women in the Garden and it was painted by French artist Claude Monet in 1866. I particularly like the green striped dress worn by the lady on the left. It's very probable that this dress actually existed, as it features not only in this painting but in two others, although, to be honest, there is only a small glimpse of the hem in one of them. This painting is called Luncheon on the Grass, and it was left unfinished. However, two big portions of this painting exist in Musée d'Orsay. However, Monet also made a smaller version of this same painting, that is nowadays in Pushkin Museum in Moscow. In this painting we can see the front of the green striped dress. I searched for the right kind of fabric for ages. I would have used the same fabric I used for my tennis dress if I just had found another duvet cover. Alas, I only had one and it wasn't enough. Finally I settled for this green striped cotton that I found and ordered from Karnalux, Estonia. The stripes were a little pale, but the fabric was still nice. I started from the skirt. I bought the 1865 elliptical skirt pattern from Truly Victorian. The first thing to do then was to print out the pattern and assemble the pattern. There are quite a many sheets as the skirt is huge, however I oddly enjoy this task. For once, I cleared out the dining table to deal with the huge skirt pieces. I'm starting from the front and pinning the side front pieces onto the center front piece. Now, let's sew. During the 1860s, the sewing machine really started arriving in people's homes, so sewing this dress with a sewing machine is, for once, historically correct. However, my machine is from the early 20th century and a bit more modern. I do have a more accurate Sigma 12 that first came out in 1865. At that point, the model was called New Family Sewing Machine. My machine is from the year 1888. I first tried to sew this dress with it but then found out that the machine needed some maintenance after sitting still for many months. The side back pieces were a bit too wide for my fabric, so I added small triangles of fabric to the corners. Now all the skirt pieces are connected and we can add the pleats. Let's cut the waistband. I'll interface the waistband with fusible interfacing. Not historically accurate, but the interfacing will be hidden, so nobody's going to know. And here is a nice lesson for you. Measure your waist before you cut the waistband. After making another waistband, I'll make sure that the waistband fits with the right period undergarments as well. In fact, I cut my waistband purposefully too long to trim it to the right length later. As I already had my crinoline on, let's test if it's possible to sew in a crinoline. I 
I can't lift my feet to the saddle as the hoops are in the way. Okay, after some adjustment I can sew, but it feels very awkward. It might work slightly better with a stool with no back, but I bet the crinolines were removed when it came to time to do sewing. The back is cartridge pleated, which has to be done by hand. Here I'm doing simple running stitches with cotton thread. I did the second row in white thread, as the thread may be visible in the finished garment. To get really tight gathers, I arrange the gathers by stroking them with a pin. Now I can pin the waistband on. I sew the cartridge pleated part of the skirt to the waistband by hand. The rest of the waistband can be sewn on by machine. I'll finish the waistband by hand. I'll add the thread loop and a button for the closure. To make a thread loop, you'll first add a few threads to make the base. I hold my threads up with my thumb so that they have the same length. Then I start covering the base threads with the buttonhole stitch. The needle goes into the loop. The thread coming from the eye of the needle is twisted around the needle and the needle is pulled through. The stitches go neatly next to each other, not too tight, not too loose. Another thread loop and a button goes to the inside of the waistband. evening out the skirt to the floor length. At this point all my family members know how to mark the hem of the skirt as that's one thing I can't do myself. I'll sew a simple narrow hem. As the event where I needed my dress was approaching fast, I switched to my modern sewing machine. Now, let's make a start with the bodies. The first thing to do is to make a mock-up. After some adjustments, I have a fitting pattern and I can cut my bodies. I am flatlining the bodies with this white cotton poplin. Mm -hmm. 
I stitched just inside the darts to keep the lining and the main fabric together when I sew the darts. The dart looks good, so I can finish the end by tying the ends in a knot. Not a bad fit. I could take just a little bit in at the back though. I finished the body seams with overcasting. Now, let's cut the sleeves. The sleeves are lined the same way as the bodies. Here I attach the sleeves. I had cut the bodies a bit long on purpose, now I'll shorten it to the right length. I finished the lower hem of the bodies with some bias tape I found in my stash. Now, the dress needed some more color. I found this sari in a local thrift store a long time ago. I realized that the green of the sari was the perfect pop of color. I started by using the sari fabric to make some covered patterns. I have made covered patterns before, but these were a bit different from the what I had used before. I had just posted to somebody that I needed no machine to do this, that it was easy. Just follow the instructions. Yeah, no. I cut the circles to the right size. Push the circles to the plastic cup with the button. Then I was supposed to push the fabric edges to the tiny sharp bits on the wrong side of the button. However, the cup was too loose for my button and my fabric and the fabric circle had already shifted and didn't reach the edges of the button evenly. And even though I tried and tried again, the fabric didn't stick to the button prongs. So I went back to an old way of doing this and cut the fabric slightly bigger and gathered it by hand. That made it a bit easier to get the fabric evenly around the button. After figuring out the right way of adding the button back on, it should have been easy to finish the button. But the backs didn't stay put. Finally, I had to add glue to some of the buttons to keep the backs in place. Before I could attach those frustrating buttons, I had to finish the neckline with bias tape. Now 
check and mark the places for the buttonholes. Apparently here my filming gets a bit choppy. Here I'm finishing the sleeve cuffs and then I'm already making boning channels out of ribbon. The buttonholes seem to be sewn on already. I sew the boning channels on by hand And here I'm adding the bones, which are just your regular cable ties cut to the right lengths. Now we need some hooks and eyes to attach the bodies and the skirt together. Now let's get back to that sari and the very necessary decorations of the dress. I cut the sari in long strips that were about 10 cm wide. Then I connect the strips and stitch them into a long tube. It took a while to turn this tube the right way. Next, I will gather the tube, but instead of sewing the gathering stitches in a straight line, I'll make a zigzag line across the strip. When I now gather the strip and do some adjusting, I'll get this nice ruffle that sort of looks like a vine. I'm trying to find the best way to position the ruffle. Then I'm sewing the strip on by hand. And then I needed to make more ruffle, as I quite quickly realized that my first ruffle wasn't enough. Let's add the ruffle to the hem of the bodice. The dress fits fine, but needs more ruffle and a big bow. I made a bit narrower ruffle for the neckline. And then I want to add some ruffle here. So we still need to make a hat for our dress. And in the 1860s, the hats were really small, at least, at least during the summer, and they perched on top of the hairdo. Um, sometimes they were called BBs or, or half bonnets. So I think I'm going to use all the little pieces of buckram, like this one, and well, this my made buckram that it isn't really stiff, but I think it will make a nice base for the hat. 
and then I'll start decorating it with fabric and flowers and lace and whatnot. It'd be a bit more form fit in here. It actually would be, oops, I put it like back like this. And perhaps it would curve a bit down here so I can make it. Darts. Yeah. I'm closing the dots with a zigzag stitch that connects the edges together. Let's add a white cotton lining. I'll stitch the lining on from the edge. Then I'll add a layer of wadding. I first tried to use this green sari fabric for the cover. The result was awful, ugly green monstrosity that no one needed to see. I realized that my whole base was too big and I needed to rip the cover off and start anew. Now, with a smaller base, I also decided to go with a more neutral white silk dupion. However, before attaching the silk, I added wire to the edge to be able to shape the hat properly. Now the hat base has been covered with silk and the edges have been finished with bias tape. Now we only need to add a ton of decoration. Okay, this little lace doily is meant for a hat. It has the perfect size. I don't even need to cut it if I just fold the edges under. How much lace is too much?
Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to my channel and see you soon. Bye.